Well, hello everyone, welcome. Um, I'm Mel Hauser, I use she, they pronouns. I'm the executive director here at All Brains Belong. Welcome to Brain Club, so lovely to see you all. Let me share screen and get us oriented. Okay, so today um, is our monthly book chat. Um, this month, we'll be discussing themes from Dr. Devin Price's new book on learning shame. Um, just by, by, I, uh, by way of orienting us, as we always do as we start Brain Club, this, of course, is our education space for the collective ABB community to provide education about neurodiversity to bring people together and contribute to systems change by shifting social norms. This is a space where people can collectively learn and unlearn together, feel safe, and for many people experience something that might be quite different from the outside world. With the idea that by promoting, um, showing up authentically and perhaps new ways of thinking and being, but that's, and then you go out into, your, into the rest of the world and that's how we change the world. And although All Brains Belong has lots of different types of programs, um, uh, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's not a support group. Um, this is for education. All forms of participation are okay here at Brain Club. You can have your video on or off, but even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. Please feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or whatever else needs doing. Um, you definitely do not need to look at the camera or any other neuronormative construct. You're welcome to communicate however you are most comfortable. Uh, there will be a portion of tonight's Brain Club with a pre-recorded video that will play, but we'll have uh, plenty of time for discussion. Um, but uh, while the video is playing, you'll have access to the chat. Um, and then during discussion, you're welcome to use mouth words or the chat. We also have private messaging enabled, so you're welcome to send private messages or questions that way. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, in order to keep the space um, uh, safe for all participants, we just ask that if you are bringing up something that was distressing to you, we ask that you discuss the impact of those experiences, not the details of the events themselves. Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the closed captioning live transcript icon, but if not, look for the more dot, dot, dot and choose show subtitles. You can do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to open the chat box. Oh, wow, there's a lot of chat activity. Hello, everybody. Speaking of the chat, um, one of the things that we strive to do um, in neuro inclusive space is to navigate conflicting access needs. And the chat is a good example of conflicting access needs. For many community members, the chat is a way of being able to have access to communicate without mouth words. Um, it eases working memory. You don't have to like hold, you know, keep your idea in working memory until it's time to get a turn. You can just blurt it out in the chat. Also allows for more processing time um, and, and direct engagement back and forth with between community members. However, there are other community members for whom the chat is like visual clutter and it's distracting. There's even startle response to when it pops up and, and it moves quite quickly sometimes and it might be hard to follow. So as best we can um, suggest some strategies for navigating conflicting access needs in the chat, um, after the first time, if, if you're a person for whom the chat is problematic, after the first time it pops up, try not closing the window. Um, this way, when new messages come on, it won't pop anymore. It'll just, the new, the new message will replace the old message, but it won't have that like startle thing. Um, that's the, that, 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 that's, that's one option. Another option is to disable chat preview. So on your Zoom toolbar, the chat box, there's this little up carrot. If you click on that, it'll show you the words show chat previews and it has a checkbox next to it. If you click on that, it'll get rid of the checkbox and that's how you disable chat preview. 
Okay, we're ready. Um, actually, before we dive into our topic, we wanted to just preview because, of course, uh, next next week is a new month already, and our theme for next month is autistic culture. Um, thank you, Sarah. There's registration link in the chat. Got a lot of really good, really good topics, and I want to draw your attention to uh, twice a year. We have like special brain clubs that that uh, we draw draw a larger audience in, or like really trying to make a, make a splash on our content. And so this is our third annual presentation of the shifting the autism narrative, the impact of stigma on health. So I'll be the presenter, and we kind of go into like all the things that the healthcare system does that are really bad for health. Um, so we hope we hope that you'll join us. Okay, here we go. Um, so Dr. Devin Price is an autistic social psychologist, professor, and author. Um, and um, this, this is like hands down, like one of the best books I've read in a really long time. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna walk through some of the themes. Um, uh, we with a combination of quotes excerpted from the book. Um, and our All Brains Belong staff team, some of us, we had a we had a little conversation about the book that we recorded that we'll play for you. So systemic shame. Devin writes, I suffer from systemic shame, the powerful self-loathing belief that says I am to blame for the circumstances I'm moving in. And that the only way my problems can be overcome is through individual goodness and grit. Of course, the more a person suffers, the more our economic system and public institutions are primed us to convince to convince us that it's all our fault. Evan writes. I'd chased, and, and by the way, this book, you know, so it's, it's, it's this really inter interesting um, combination of both personal reflection of a trans autistic person's experience of personally navigating systemic shame, along with history and the social psychology of shame. So it's really a fusion of all those things, which I think make this book particularly really powerful. So um, Devin writes, I'd chased after achievements and approval all my life, believing it would grant me self-love. When my external goals had been met, I felt even more empty. It felt like nothing I ever did mattered and never could because none of it would ever help me stop being me. Oh. When we think about all of the different ways that humans are othered and harmed. Very appropriately, Devin writes that the needs of multiply marginalized people absolutely have to be centered. And it's really important to recognize the shared root causes of suffering for all people, these broken power systems that are hurting everybody. Systemic shame prevents us from recognizing we share these struggles with the majority of other beings on the planet, rather than coming together to demand better of existing systems or building alternative ones together, systemic shame consumes us with fear and self-loathing and pushes us apart. Devin introduces this framework of three levels of systemic shame, personal shame, interpersonal shame, and global shame. Personal shame being self-loathing and self-blame, a process that starts really early where, where we become desperate to hide our feelings, our needs, our true self. 
The next level, interpersonal shame, blaming and shaming others who share identities and experiences with us because they reflect the qualities we've been conditioned to hate in ourselves. And then building upon that global shame that humanity as a whole is filled with bad people. Christ writes that personal shame is pushed on us most directly when we're young through the many tiny rejections and social judgments that later develop into a broader worldview. Kids are very good at trying to figure out what society's unspoken rules are because learning those rules protects them from being rejected or abandoned. Children appear to be hardwired to find and adopt the attitudes of the culture that surround them, even when those attitudes are cruel and unfair. Evan Price identifies the values of systemic shame um, and there's, you know, a huge, huge overlap, of course, with, with so many of the themes we talk about at Brain Club, um, that uh, all of these aspects of white supremacy that is just so infused into everything, perfectionism, individualism, consumerism, the idea of like, personal wealth, personal responsibility, um, ex, you know, being more important than the collective. You know, in, like we talk about here, independence as opposed to interdependence. Preserving the status quo. Systemic shame leaves us isolated, mistrustful, and completely stuck when it comes to imagining a more enriching, more connected way to lead our lives. So um, with that, we'll watch this, this uh, pre-recorded conversation from our ABB team about these themes. And uh, you're welcome, welcome to use the chat as we go. And then we'll, after the video, I have a couple more slides with some quotes from the book um, that, uh, to, to how do we move out of this? And then we'll have time for discussion. Uh oh, Alina, I have no volume. Oh, is it the like share screen button with the checkbox thing? I hate that. If you unshare and reshare. How's that? No. Not yet. Still nothing? Still nothing. Huh. All right. I think I have somebody coming to assist me. Unshare. What I'll do is I can I can zigzag and we can go out of order. Um, just gonna just there's a conversation in the chat unfolding about the idea of um, like learning learning about um, you know discovering your brain. Oh yeah, it's working. That's good. Good to go. Good to go. I see something play out for my child that reminds me of something that was really hard, is really hard for me, particularly socially. I so desperately want to shut that down because it comes from a place of not wanting my child to suffer in the ways that I've suffered. But what it actually does is it contributes, and I think as Devin Price writes, the like many tiny rejections and social judgments that actually imparts my child's broader worldview about that there is one correct way to be. 
Right. And then I right. layer on the judgment of myself for doing it. I talk with a lot of families and a lot of times we're talking about, you know, parents wanting to make sure that the way they're talking about themselves is not reflecting things that they want to see in their kid. And I think that, um, I think, we, I think we talk about this a lot with um, like uh, body image and, you know, if somebody's talking about how disgusting they feel in their body and how much they want to lose weight and how much they hate how their body looks right now and I look like their body, that's going to make me feel bad even though they're talking about themselves. And so that that way that like internalized shame really spreads to everybody else and the you know, I, I want the way that I, the way that I want to talk about bodies and body image or brains and how they work or anything to my kids, I want to talk about that way to myself because that's the only way they're going to learn to. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's a really, I think that's how, that's how those cycles perpetuate of, you know, I've, you know, whatever, I've always hated my body, so I'm going to teach my kids to hate their body, I'm going to teach their kids to hate their body, whereas if we can reverse that, we can, we can stop it and, and change the narrative. It, it's really difficult to acknowledge that, like, the world can be a really hard place, and that doesn't mean you should hide these parts of yourself that might make it harder to be in the world. And I think those are really difficult things. You know, I think we often hear that, you know, I want to, I want to pair my kids for the world. Stuff's going to be hard. And I want to, you know, I want to, I want to make it easier for everybody. I want to make it easier for myself too. And it's, it's really hard to, to do that without falling into the, okay, I'm going to, you know, conform myself and fit myself into the, round hole when I'm a square peg. Also, kids are really um, what's the word? Perceptive. So usually they get the cue. They know. They know. So it's about us reinforcing that. Like when we see a shift in them, like, hey, what you know, what why are you uncomfortable right now? Or what what's going on that's putting up your radar? I mean, often they they know just like we know and we knew then and we just didn't have the language for it. They know now too. And now we have the language for it, right? So we can encourage them by just like body language, cues, and allowing the conversation. And it's gonna happen, you know, uncomfortable things are gonna happen all day, every day. Um, so it's about like giving them when we recognize the cues in them that there there's something going on that they're uncomfortable with, um, reinforcing that like yeah you you do feel that and that is whatever is happening is happening. And I think what you just said like when when you feel uncomfortable, if you don't have language to understand why you make up a narrative and that narrative right. is I'm broken I'm defective. And so yeah. like, what would it be like to say, I'm uncomfortable and there's like a differential for that. Right. Um, it's, it's like, it's not just that I'm broken. Like there's other things on the menu to possibly explain that, which is just like, these are not my people. These are not my people. You know, they, they, they're talking about something I'm not interested in. Okay. I'm going to just go, I'm going to go to another environment where I'm comfortable. Right, because I think it's important to point out that you know those those narratives we make up for for ourselves that we're we're different, we're broken, and everybody else is doing this, and we just need to try harder. Like those don't come from nowhere; those come from a society that tells us that all the time. Um, they're the narratives that society creates that then we just kind of internalize and bring to our own experience. And there's nothing to counter it because people are not authentic. Right. Right. So like I, I what comes to my, I have like sort of like my my brain stores memories like in these little boxes and categories. So I, like I have the social gathering bucket. Right. And so um, all the times I've gone to social gatherings that I have felt uncomfortable at and not known what to do. And like, I don't know, I'm going to like spend like 20 minutes pouring a drink because I got nothing else to do. I got to look busy um, like 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 just like all those like. I, I bet I was like in retrospect, I bet I was not the only one who felt uncomfortable. 
but no one says it like no one names it so you look around and you're like there's 50 people and they all look comfortable and there's me i'm very uncomfortable what does that mean about me mm -hmm. you know the chances are everybody's uncomfortable unless they have so bought into their mask right like they've so bought into you know the the brain rules of like, this is what I do. I come in and I pour a drink and then I like talk about myself. Like, I don't know what that's like, but, but like, I think there are people who like, they, they, and I think that that actually for me connects to what, what Devin Price wrote about, about this idea of like the personal shame progressing to the interpersonal shame is like, I have built my mask around blocking out the things that have been taught to me are bad. That the characteristics of me, I am hiding them. And what I put forth is everything else. And so that is, I buy into that and I reinforce that and I protect that. Yeah, I think a lot of times people joke of joke about like, oh, I don't, I don't have my own personality. I've just created a personality from taking the pieces of all the people around me. Um and I think that it just it 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 can bring that track can really easily bring you to a place of not knowing even your like what you're saying not even knowing yourself who your true self is um because you've really fully gone into that into the other persona that you've created and I think we see that sometimes I talk with people when you know, people when people are first um, learning about their own brains and learning about you know neurodivergence, um, and there there can be a big grief process um, for a lot of different reasons. But I think one of them is, you know, I'm losing this 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 version of myself that I used to be. Um, this you know mass version. This maybe like sometimes it feels like a completely different person and it feels like you're you're, you're losing that person sometimes um and that can that can be a intense and and a process that has a lot of you know grief and emotions with it sometimes sometimes people have to shed relationships because it becomes too hard to like you can't go back you can't put it back on and so you're either going to show up with this person that like doesn't even really know you and see what happens or like i just that feels like I have too much dissonance here. I'm just going to like new life now. Does anybody else relate to that? Yeah, I, I think energetically, um, as I've been in the process of unmasking and I think that I can sense others masks before, whereas when I was masking myself more heavily, you don't even realize it or notice it. And now I think that I can see when others are unmasking and that I can really hone in on the transparency and authenticity of the true self. I don't know if anyone else has felt the energeticness of it too. I have chills right now applying this structure of like personal shame, interpersonal shame, global shame, like I think that when I spot a mask, it feels unsafe to me. And I, 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 can't, I have a hard time engaging now because I also like energetically like perceive that I'm like, I don't know where I stand with you because you're fake. And I have put that in a bucket and it's it's not act it, it, and I think that's what Devin Price wrote about like don't do that like don't do that it's that we, we share this with most people on the planet so but but it's involuntary it's automatic it's limbic it's just you know but like okay now I'm aware of it can I zoom out and recognize like we are sharing this struggle can we just name the thing and if we can name the thing that gives us a chance to reimagine mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you put it in, in the unsafe you're... bucket, you might, if you put it in the unsafe bucket, you might miss the magic. And they may miss the magic too. Right, because you're not open to it. So I think that it's, um, it, it's also acknowledging that unmasking and showing up as your true authentic self is not safe for everybody in every situation. And, um, 
you know, we, we want to make the world a better place to be able to, so people are able to do that in every part of their lives. Um, and I guess maybe it's reducing the shame around sometimes masking and sometimes, you know, showing up as a mass version of yourself to be able to get the thing done, whatever that is, um, that, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's not a complete moral failing necessarily if you do do that sometimes, or if you do kind of put those up sometimes. Absolutely. Um, I recently, I might edit this whole thing out, although we see my trend about that. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm doing this cross class dialogues class through think again, and I am finding I am masking so heavily. I'm not masking my neurodivergence or my disability. I talk about that all the time, um, but I am so consumed with how I'm being perceived in that space that every single detail of what I share or don't share, I mean, I'm exhausted after that class. Um, and that's how life used to be like all the time. And it's not like it's not a moral failing to mask. It's like your limbic system just like makes you stay out of the chaos by hiding hiding anything about myself that could that is anything more than like the neutral, like what I have decided or society has taught me is a neutral thing. Which gets in the way. It gets in the way of connection. I think I think that if if we can show up as our authentic selves, those who are not usually either disappear from the scene, or they they find themselves wanting to open up and move towards it. You know, because often when you show up as your authentic self, the ones who are not showing up as their authentic selves are just they disappear. They're gone from the conversation, from the room, because it's terrifying. It's terrifying. So it's actually, you may feel terrified too, but they feel more terrified. <laughs> That's been my experience. Absolutely. Which is, it doesn't make it easier. It's not, none of it's easy, but it's, um, it's definitely, uh, I think easier to show up when you know you're being your true self. And it's hard when I think to Sierra's point, like, you may not even really know what that is. Right. Like, what is, who is my true self? I don't know. I just, I don't know. Um, and, 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 and maybe it starts from a place of like, just even recognizing, like, when do I feel safe and comfortable? When do I not? And like, reflecting on the patterns of that, like. I mean, I think that's why it's important to have to like continually i guess continually outreach to people i'm thinking like from an organization sense but like just continue to have that openness of you know knowing that people are gonna be at a place where they're ready to engage in a community like that at different places and having it be like a continued open thing i think we talked to this similarly about you know when when somebody's in burnout and a really nice thing can be like I like being offered to do things with people, even if most of the time I'm going to say no, because I, I just can't. Um, but it's, it's nice to continually be offered and know that if I say no, that doesn't mean I'm not going to be offered to do that again, or I'm not going to be able to offer to be engaging in that again. Um, and, and I guess just having that, having that openness of, you know, if or when you're ever ready to join, come on in. Absolutely. Like, it's not like the offer expires. Maybe, maybe the one more thing we can talk about, just like, I think, because I think our folks at Brain Club, like, you know, who are like stuck in the trenches and we see sometimes when we talk about these topics, we see in the chat, like, well, I don't know how to tell people that I'm too tired to hang out with them. Like, like we're at this place, right? Where I don't even know how to get started. Like, I know that it's just like, I have to, I have to do the thing. People expect me to do the thing. Where do people, like, how do people start? I like to think about like what it doesn't necessarily have to be all or nothing like what part of your life can you show up as your true authentic self 
in, even if that's, you know, one, one brain club once a week or one person in your life or one aspect, you know, I think we talk about this with, um, with like, with gender diversity and with the idea that, you know, you, in the process of coming out, you may start by just coming out to your family and friends at first and not coming out at work for a year or so until that feels more comfortable. And that that's, that's okay to kind of do it in steps sometimes and um, identify those, those safe places and those safe people, even if it's a really small group or, or even just if it's by yourself. Yeah, I think that's a really good point about um, brain club, even like um, group, the group medical appointments. That's like where your confidence is going to come from, you know, it's like being in a room with people that are having the same struggle, which will build your confidence, which will have you show up in other spaces that is not so terrifying. Um, I think that's that's a huge part is like building confidence. And then you can say, hey, I'm feeling like introvert today. I'm feeling extrovert, you know, whatever the language you want to use is. And it's like, it's no big deal. And people be like, oh, I get it. You know, it's not, and we're not rejecting you. It's not that I don't want to go to your thing or show up at the meeting. It's, you know, I'm just taking care of myself. Right. I don't have spoons. Yeah. Right. Normalizing that. Right. I think what, what helps a lot of, a lot of folks, um, in group medical appointments is to explicitly be told that there are other people who feel uncomfortable. Like you feel uncomfortable. There's a lot of people who feel uncomfortable. In fact, that's like why we made this preview video or why we wrote this agenda or like, cause, cause this is like a thing and, oh, okay. Um, cause there's this assumption kind of like me going to the terrible dinner party. Um, there's this assumption that everyone else looks like they're comfortable and that I'm the, I'm, I'm the one left out. Nobody wants like that feeling feels so bad. So I'm just going to avoid, I'm going to avoid, I'm going to withdraw from the things that make me feel that way. Yeah. That's like building muscle memory then, right? When you show up in the group medical appointments or you show up at the brain club and you're like building your muscle memory, like, oh, this is a safe place. And then you recognize what safe places are and yeah. Your body recognizes what it feels like to be safe mm -hmm. and comfortable and your authentic self and not masking. Yeah. And then even right. if you are in an uncomfortable space, your muscle memory, your mind will remember what it feels like in your body to be in a safe place. And then you can carry that with you. Absolutely. And because you know that there's this difference now, because before maybe you've never actually felt safe. Mm -hmm. um, before it's just like, oh, like social interaction. It's all like that. What that is, it just that I feel so awful because there's something wrong with me. So I had my true mm -hmm. self. And, but, but really now there's this distinction. There's some situations where I feel comfortable and some situations where I don't. And right. I'm the same person in either way. So what does that mean? It means that the environment influences how I feel. It's not about that I'm broken, that something's wrong with me, that I might feel uncomfortable right now. It's like, what is the environment around me? And can I trust my limbic system and be okay if it's saying unsafe or safe and trust my intuition? And I think it's a process, you know, getting used to trusting yourself since we're so used to not trust, uh, at least for me, I'm not used to trusting myself. It's been a process. Well, I think that's part of this whole personal shame conversation around not only do I not trust myself, but I've taught myself that my intuitive drive is wrong. And in fact, I've been taught to hate it, loathe it, blame it for all kinds of things. And so we have this brain body disconnect where it's like, well, you know, just like stop it, stop it, stuff it. Um, because it's not normal. It's not normal. Like stop being afraid, stop being concerned, stop being anxious, like just stuff it, stuff it. And, and, and we wonder why we lose touch with intuition. I think if, I, I think it's, you know, the same process as somebody who spent a lot of my life dieting and a lot of my life, very intentionally ignoring hunger cues and pushing those down. It's no wonder that I can't sense those now, 
like it's it's no wonder that you know i have a hard time trusting my gut or feeling my instincts or whatever that is because those have been pushed down for so long my gut says i don't want to do the thing and i push myself to do it anyway that resonates with me yeah yeah so it's a process it's a process of just like what would it look like what would it look like to go with intuition and see what happens like it you might overcall it you know you might overcall it like a lot but i think it's like practice it's like what olivia said about muscle memory like you actually have to practice like all right well my 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 gut says do this and i'm gonna do that and you do that enough of the time and it becomes a thing where like ooh, i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna go with that because i think you know it's 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 like recovering, recovering from shame, like, yet yeah, we, we do this in community. We do this by hearing that other people are navigating this, but the intuition thing, like that is also, I think, part of, part of, part of like, um, it's part of the, the, the healing process. Selena. No problem. Sorry for the like wildly conservative looking uh suggested videos after this. Yeah, I was like, I was like, browser. what even is that? Like, why that is that coming up? <laughs> yeah, not a browser that I use. So I guess it's just assuming that I'm super into conservative weirdos. I'm not. <laughs> My At mistake. least this browser window played the volume though. So there you go. All right. Anything else you needed for me? No, thank you so much. All right. Have a good one, guys. You Bye. too. So where do we go from here? Someone in the chat before the video said something like, you know, stories can have a happy ending. That's 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 where we're shifting now. What I'm really longing for on some level is to stop feeling as if I'm broken and trapped inside a world that was not built for me. Moving beyond systemic shame means working to build vulnerable relationships with other people, witnessing firsthand the restorative effects of being fully seen and recognizing that even in its imperfections, humanity can be loved and trusted. Devin Price uses the term expansive recognition to mean the reassuring and grounding sense that you are unbreakably connected to the rest of humanity and that all sides of you, including your flaws, are part of what keeps you bonded to everybody else. Building new relationships comes down to two principles consistency and authenticity. If you keep showing up regularly and keep honestly expressing yourself and your viewpoints, I think as Liz wrote in the chat, spraying your authenticity, eventually the right people will take a shine to you. When people disagree with you or don't understand your perspective, you'll have the kinds of conflicts that are enriching and worth having. Shame is an act of avoidance. It's pulling away and hiding, motivated by mistrust and fear. The way we escape systemic shame is by rejecting the desire to withdraw and instead choose to embrace, moving toward the very people we fear judging ourselves and revealing the pain we've been in. It's only when we reveal our flaws that we have the opportunity to realize that our struggles are shared and are in fact the product of oppressive systems that target us all. None of us is broken. Nobody is a failure. It's the systems that have failed us. And as soon as we recognize that, we can move beyond them and create something better.
So with that, I would love to hear, oh, Sarah's got another quote. Sarah writes, it's easiest to experience self-compassion when we believe we did the best we could with the resources we had at that time. But no one does their best all the time. Sometimes we make decisions we just can't be proud of from any angle. When we can't endorse reality as good, we can still strive to accept it. And therein lies healing, even if it isn't pretty. It's like the whole radical acceptance thing. I think another theme of this book, um, oh, I'll, I'll hold my comment. Sierra, go for it. Sorry, I didn't see your, I didn't see your hand in the corner. Oh, you, your you, mic thing. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I can raise it after you started talking. Um, I just, I, I really, first of all, Sarah, I really appreciate you bringing out all the quotes you have um, in the chat. It's been, you've been bringing some great quotes in. And I, I think this one really brings out the, the aspect of perfectionism that's in um, systemic shame. And I think how, like we were just um, talking about this at a um, topic about burnout the other day about how, you know, it's really hard to let go of that. Like I need to do everything 100% perfectly. And sometimes to get through shame, to get through burnout, whatever that is, you need to be able to do the minimum required. You need to be able to do what needs to do to get through and that's really really hard sometimes um and getting through that aspect of shame is just the part I really liked absolutely especially then you layer on like the common autistic pattern of replaying a situation over and over and over and over and over and over again like you're just stacking it up Michelle um I have not read this book but I've read other Devin Price books, and I've actually um, been privileged to have a number, uh, some conversations with Devin, and they've been wonderful. So I will go and read this book. Um, but I think the theme of this book will be very helpful to my parent support group because um, a number of the parents have been... Um, trying to understand how to deal with adult children who are not accepting any help. And part of it may be because they're going through this kind of systemic shame thing. It's a possibility. So um, I'll suggest they take a look at this. But the other thing I'm thinking of is if you look at the um, themes that Devin Price puts forward, it seems as though you need to strike a balance. You've got to put yourself out there enough to create sufficient connections to the rest of humanity so that you're not isolated, so that you're creating sufficient connections so that you're not creating kind of personal shame or individual self-loathing. But you can't do it so much that you're using up all your spoons so that you're feeling defeated and you end up feeling like a failure because you're so depleted. Um, and that would put you right into systemic failure. So it, it's kind of like, what's the right balance? How do you know what that is? You know, so that that's one of the, the challenges that I thought of immediately. Absolutely. And I don't think there is a right answer. And I think it's, it's this journey, right? It's this journey of discovering your needs. Um, and, 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 and if someone has an access need for a certain amount of pacing your activity, like this is all just going to, you know, everything's going to be connected to everything. Um, but I, but I, 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 I do think that one of the themes we haven't directly talked about yet from this book was just the idea that recovering from systemic shame, Devin Price writes, cannot be done in isolation, that it needs to be done in community. 
It's about zooming out, recognizing these broken systems that shaped your self-narrative from toddlerhood onwards. Um, and I think, I mean, honestly, that's like what we try to do at Brain Club, right? Like, so it's, it's the idea of, you know, you hear your story or elements of your experience kind of reflected back to you through someone else's story and Wow, I guess I'm not the only one who experienced that, huh? I love on uh, page 188 when um, Devin Price says it was, you know, it's talking about kind of coming into his authentic self. And says it was like a series of soft, warm streetlights had illuminated a path before me would have been blocked by darkness. And I just thought like, oh, it gave me chills. And I thought that that's kind of what we do at Brain Club. really important that like you know showing up con connecting like connection doesn't have to look a particular way connection's not like going to a dinner party that's not connection i mean it is for some people but not for all brains and certainly not for for a lot of brains that are are here right now um but you know it's 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 connection is locking on a brain club right like connection is writing a letter connection is it can make it it's it, it, it can be anything I have, uh, uh, hello everyone. I, I, I've spent a lot of years, you know, looking at my own shame. And, you know, years ago it was, uh, oh gosh, um, it was that preacher guy that wrote a lot of those books on game, uh, toxic shame. Um, and he had some good ideas, but it wasn't based on a lot of science. And, and then over years, counselors passed along Brene Brown, which that was very valuable work. At least, at least what she does is based on science. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. I, I, well, I was going to ask, and I'll still ask it to uh, Mel or anyone else who's read the book, um, you know, whether you're familiar with Brene Brown's work and what, what the differences you saw between the two books are. Um, I, I what what I'm picking up on, you know, is you know the systemic shame is you know that's not normally an issue for neurotypical people, I assume, um, and so that's not something that's really addressed uh, with Brittany Brown's work, I don't think. What a great question. So um, I I am familiar with Brittany Brown's work, and in fact, um, I'm gonna maybe if Sarah and Lizzie. Uh, or Lizzie can find it faster than I will, but eventually like one of us will put the link in the chat. We did a, I think, I think actually it was our first ever book chat or maybe second ever book chat in 2023 was, um, I thought it was just me, but it isn't by Brene Brown. Um, there's a lot of similarities between that particular book and this book, I think, but I think where for me, um, It was like fusing this lens of social justice onto this conversation. You know, Brene Brown's four steps about like, so I recognize I'm in shame. I tell someone, they say me too. Um, and then I can zoom out and then wonder like, what, what set me up personally, individually to experience that shame? Um, and then what are the social, like the social forces that, set me up individually so it's about the like the individual experience of shame but this is talking about like the collective the collective that in the transformational experience of recognizing that everyone is struggling with this everyone is being impacted and harmed by these systems that shape your narrative and so that's anyway and, and, and Devin Price cites Brene Brown's work like there's definitely like pieces that are are, are 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 right in there but i think like for me the biggest difference is the shift from the individual to the collective
community-based healing. Hi, Sarah, go for it. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to articulate this well, but I'll just, anyway, I'll try. Um, for me, it's there, I can't get away from, like my, I literally, there's, there's like this, I, I guess I look at the evolutionary biology and I like, and if you, and if I follow polyvagal theory on the evolutionary biology, I like literally have two body systems that are in contradiction. Uh, and, and I mean, I have a body system that's all about like, like the stuff that actually makes me capable of like regenerating cells is incredibly vulnerable. That's the reason it needs this really mean system that protects it. And it's like, it's like this really vulnerable part of me made a pact with the devil. And I don't think, he, and, and that's the human, then for me, that's the human condition. It's like this incredibly vulnerable part of me um, that evolved in that, if you look at how, the, how they think that, how they think life evolved on the planet earth, like it, it evolved in a, in a context that was energy rich and predator free. And then all of a sudden somebody like 500 million years later decided to eat somebody else. And the next thing you know, we've got a sympathetic nervous system, you know, and we're all terrorizing each other with claws and fangs. And, and so, and so we've got these two natures in ourselves, like the fundamental nature of us is like, is loving and vulnerable, but it's also tremendously deeply hidden because the outside world we experience is incredibly dangerous. And so we've got a protector that has to be fierce, but it's not our core nature. And so we're in contradiction in ourselves. And I don't think our society collectively has reckoned with that well. I think we're in denial about how hard it is to be human, which makes sense. I mean, we didn't have this, we didn't have, we didn't even have a clue of what we were up against, you know, until like, you know, the last 50 or maybe, you know, 50, maybe a little more, but, but around 50 years, we, we really haven't had a very clear sense of what we were up against, but, but we're really up against this huge thing and we've been up against it for all of human existence and, and we haven't figured out how to deal with it. And, and so we've been shaming and blaming each other, hoping it would work. And, 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 and it doesn't, and it's not gonna, and, 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 and so we're struggling with how to transform it and we're struggling and, and individually I'm vulnerable to it because, you know, my, my own body has made a pact with the devil and individually the culture is vulnerable to it because you know, there's a loving part of us and there's a devil part of us. And when we get threatened, we're the devil. And when we're, and when we're not threatened, we're like all, you know, we're all like kumbaya. So I think we're just really, we're really struggling to, to come to terms with human nature and what to do about the contradictions that are inherent in our nature and how, and how to, and, and, and how to like, you know, be together with that and with those contradictions on planet earth. And I think just naming, naming some of these, these things, I mean, I think I, yeah, I mean, I, I, what you just said, Sarah, reminds me of the part of the book that talks about how, like, young children pick up these messages specifically because it, it's a way of staying safe. So I adopt these messages, I internalize these messages about what is good and bad, because this is the way, this path is how I stay safe. And then that's exactly what, like, that's exactly what breeds that first level of personal shame. I mean, that makes so much sense, Mel. I mean, what you just said, I mean, that, yeah, we're just trying to we're just little, we're little vulnerable beings trying to stay safe. We're aligning with the, what the culture says, and and um, because that's how we get safety. And then you know, and and without even knowing the implications of doing that. Yes, that's exactly right. And then by by the time there's any awareness of that, it's like I don't want to say it's too late because like we're all doing the work of unlearning now. Um, but we, we're at a place of needing to unlearn as opposed to like what would it be like for, you know, every child to actually grow up knowing that there's not one right way to be a person? You know, I have a pastoral counseling background and it, it, it kind of gives a new, 
this sort of cultural critique thing kind of just gives me it gives a new meaning to the, the you must be born again thing <laughs> you know it's like it's like you had it's like there's there came a point in my life when i had to throw out everything i thought i knew and start to look at my life from a to you know as if i didn't know anything at all and start to and start to question everything so hard to do which is why we do it together so with that um thank you thank you all so much for being here tonight um and uh I just want to also name, um, I know obviously not, not, uh, Brain Club, of course, is, is not only for autistic people by any means, um, but many people are sensitive, um, to some of the harmful messages that come in April. So April being, you know, Autism Awareness Month, Autism Acceptance Month, and there's like a, sometimes some really performative things that go out and go out there in the world. So I just wanted to like name for those of you for whom April itself is a a trigger and you know an induction of systemic shame. Like anyway, um, just please stay connected with us. Um, that's why uh, our theme for next month's Spring Club is autistic culture, um, where we will be shining a light on some aspects of um, community members' experiences um, in, in, in relationships, in healthcare, and, you know, how, how we can, how we can do it differently. So thank you. Thank you all so much uh, for being here and being part of our community. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.